Well, this is uh, my third time speaking at pre-money. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. I was asked to speak today about ICOs and how venture capital will disappear over the next five years. Uh, I decided not to accept that challenge. And instead, I'd like to talk first about some things that I think you all know. So 2013, 2015, we saw a massive increase in valuations in venture. Median valuations went up by 3x. And I'll make all these slides available because I talk quickly. Number two, capital went up by 2x. And this is in less than a three-year period of time. We ushered in the age of what people are calling unicorns. I think that will go down 20 years from now when history writers write about this era as about the dumbest thing we ever said. I think it's useful, and I appreciate Aileen for coining it, because it got us focused on a trend in the market, which is massive increases in valuation and billion dollar valuations. Uh, but we run around saying unicorn all the time, and it really annoys me. Um, we have a saying in venture capital, which is, you name the price, we name the terms. So a billion dollars is not a billion dollars is not a billion dollars, as many of you guys know. So high prices often came with structure. And we're starting to see some of that structure work itself out. Some of the companies that raised artificially at higher valuations but with terms that need to raise more money are getting recapitalized. And those arguments and debates and fights and structures have been happening over the last couple of years. Many people, myself included, predicted that winter was coming. So what happened to winter? And that's kind of what I'd like to talk about. In 2016, venture capitalists did actually make significantly fewer investments by two to one. And 76% of venture capitalists that Upfront surveyed said that they were seeing valuations decline. And I think we've seen Fred Wilson talk about it this week and some other people have talked about it, Victor Basta, uh, what's really happened in this kind of bubble. But 2016, I think, was a fundamental year, not just because venture capitalists invested less, at, at lower prices, but they also took to pushing the entrepreneurs to cut costs and take running a business in a prudent way more seriously. And what we like to talk about in the industry is the trade-off between growth and profits. And when we're in ebullient phases and everything's all about eyeballs and growth and capturing market, it's growth at all sake. And when we start to return to normalcy, it's like profitable growth or thoughtful growth. So winter did come, but it sure was mild. And I blame global warming. But I actually mean this seriously. I blame global warming. So I want to first talk about global. And that's the influx of capital into our industry. This is foreign direct investment from China, not just in venture, but overall in the US. And you see it spike in 2016. It shouldn't surprise you, as China has become a major force on the global stage, and as they themselves have become much wealthier and aggregate assets, like any successful growing country, they look to diversify assets. So in the US, you know we have FANG. Internationally in China, they call it uh, BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And I want to give you a sense of BAT in the venture industry. If you look at Baidu, they set up a $3 billion venture fund, late stage venture fund, and a $200 million early stage fund. If you look at Alibaba, just one deal, Magic Leap, they wrote an $800 million check. Let me put that into perspective for you. That's 20 seed funds in one deal. Not even clear that deal will be successful. It may be. Uh, but there's also a huge number of Chinese investors that you've probably never heard of. And they're putting out a lot of capital. And they also have a government mandate to bring more innovation back to China. And so the global roadmap is going to change for where innovation actually happens. So some of these firms that you may or may not have heard of invested almost $700 million into WeWork. And this is before the latest WeWork rounds. 
And then there's SoftBank, the Vision Fund, Mubadala, and the Saudi PIF Fund. A hundred billion dollars in the Vision Fund. Let me help you with scale. It's hard when you throw around billions to process scale. A hundred billion dollar fund, which is supposedly just their first, is the equivalent of 400 Series A venture capital funds. 400 of them at $250 million a piece. That's how big this is. At 400 funds, you imagine, let's say, eight to 10 partners at each of these funds. So times 400 at Vision Fund, very few people are making decisions on a relative basis, moving global capital at enormous scales that we haven't seen before in our industry. And this is not irrational per se either. If you look at the price of oil, and if you are in a place that has made its wealth through an asset that you forecast in the foreseeable future will not see rising prices, you may think about diversifying your wealth and your economy and your skills, and I think that's what's going on. I have a very important book recommendation for you if you read the book, The Absent Superpower. The Absent Superpower talks about global energy prices and the impact on society and growth rates, and I think it's a very interesting book. Uh, but it's not just China, it's not just the Arab countries, this is Singapore, Tamasic, Sovereign Wealth Fund set up a $350 million fund and put $800 million, 20 seed funds, into just one deal. And in our industry, venture capitalists, we polled our peer group, 93% of them saw an increase in international LPs that wanted to invest in our funds, 93%. So people are also looking to, luckily, give us money. Um, but there's the warming part of global warming that I want to talk about. The first part of warming is the rise of the corporate VCs. If venture capitalists pulled back in 2016 and somewhat in 2017, who filled the gap? The number of corporate venture capital funds went up times two in just four years. Times two in four years. And there's the people we all know. Many of us work with them on a regular basis. Intel, Google, Qualcomm, Salesforce, Cisco. Like those names don't surprise you. But it may have surprised you to learn that one firm wrote a $200 million check into BuzzFeed and that was NBCU and Comcast. Or that GM would write a $500 million check into Lyft. Or that BMW would set up a $500 million venture fund even Sesame Street is moving in on our territory. <laughs> and unlike VCs, corporate investors actually increased their investments in 2016. And it's logical. If you've been investing for a decade or two decades and you're suddenly sitting on 14 or 16 boards and starting to see the pressures of some of them that haven't worked the way you expected, you start to cut back and focus on your winners, and you reduce the capital you're, being, you're actually deploying. If you've just set up a brand new venture fund in the last four years and you're on two boards, like your checkbook is out. And that's, you know, I think really what's been happening. The other part of warming is increase in non-traditional M&A. So here's some deals, I'm sure most of these you've heard of. The most obvious ones that people have heard of is Walmart paying $3 billion for Jet, Unilever paying a billion dollars for Dollar Shave Club, but this is becoming more commonplace as people who see that their core business is being disrupted understand that it's no longer an option to pretend that this will run its course. I predict the, the rise, and this is not a big prediction, but the rise of Walmart.com as an important counterbalance to Amazon, and I actually predict it to be good for all of us. Having one vendor that's so dominant and so powerful, a vendor that I love, but as a supplier of product in the e-commerce companies or even in some of the computer vision companies I backed, 65% of their sales are coming through Amazon. You know, when you have channel uh, aggregation, concentration, that's less good for innovation. And so I welcome a lot of these moves. 
But there's also mid-market private equity firms that are moving their dollars into this space, looking for other places to apply their capital. And there's a backlog of companies looking for liquidity. But I also would point out that we ourselves have a lot more dry powder than we once did. The green bars are the distributions that we give to our investors, to our LPs. And the white bars are the contributions that they give to venture funds. So LPs are starting to actually get money back. Four years ago, when I used to go with my little gold cup and ask for money, or my tin cup, rather, and ask for money, um, they were saying, ah, oh, we need distributions. Well, now I'm armed with, come on, you got distributions. You can part with some cash. And therefore, it shouldn't surprise you that the white bar venture dollars overall in aggregate from LPs to us are up massively, 2x in the last five years. And the number of funds have risen from 153 to 253. In fact, in 2016, which was uh, we did this survey early in 2017, there were 11 firms that had raised a billion dollars or more in venture, and another 12 that had raised $500 million. So the mega funds, the mega funds are here. And the seed investor market, the micro VC or whatever we called them 10 years ago, they're not micro. These are proper venture capital funds that are actually doing what we used to call A rounds. I mean, Aiden, who was one of the innovators, I see him sitting up here, one of the innovators in this category, uh, you know, they're now muscling into proper A round deals with real size checks and uh, doing what venture capital as an industry did even just 10, 15 years ago. This is a real trend. This is well established. When we talk to LPs about why they're giving us money, because it's useful to know why people give you money, uh, one of the surprising things that I didn't quite realize was just how much low interest rates played into their decision to give us more money and to the overfunding of the venture capital industry. And it's basically they've got huge pools of capital chasing yield. And when other sectors are not providing immediate yield, and with interest rates as low as they are, and therefore they can't put them into safer asset classes and still hit their yield returns, more is going into venture, which has a higher yield, even if higher risk, and longer term payouts. But we're getting a bigger slice of the pie. There's also money abroad by very large firms. These are just the five largest, but you probably have seen it published the top 20 or 30 this week because the new tax plan that's likely to become law will allow this, these dollars to be repatriated much more easily. Upwards of 90% of our major tech firms' cash is abroad. And when you make it easier for them to repatriate it, you will see larger pools of capital coming back into the US. So where are we all heading? If you have foreign capital up, and corporate investors up, and LP distributions up, and newer funds, and bigger funds, and more funds, and repatriation of capital, and increases in M&A, you are likely to face a very good forecast for 2018 and 2019. For, and I was very specific with my word choice of funding. You are likely to see a robust market for funding companies. I mean, unless we have nuclear war in North Korea or something like that. I think it could all change. And unsurprisingly, therefore, given all these trends, venture capitalists are pretty bullish about the future. This won't surprise you. A year ago, we pulled VCs, and what are you most interested in funding? AI and machine learning seems to be today's most interesting trend that people are funding. And the thing that they were most skeptical about a year ago was bot-based commerce, conversational commerce. Uh, whatever you want to call it. And people were pretty skeptical a year ago about blockchain. I don't know if that's changed in the last year. I think there's a pretty healthy debate about people's enthusiasm versus skepticism for blockchain. Uh, I think we're seeing some of the limitations of blockchain as a database by, what is it called, CryptoKitties? Am I getting that right, CryptoKitties? Who's a collector here? Collector? All hands up for collectors of CryptoKitties. Um, but blockchain as a database has a very unique property in allowing distributed ledgers to be formed and to aggregate and for decisions to be made about the veracity of those databases, the authenticity of the databases, and you can have anonymous transactions. So of course, we're hearing a lot about that in cryptocurrency, but it happens to be amongst the worst form of databases for everything else. And I think people hear blockchain don't 
have a background in database design think, oh, this is changing the world. It is changing one neighborhood in the world, and profoundly, I think it's important. Uh, but when you can slap blockchain on the name of your public company and have your valuation go up by 1,000%, as happened in England, uh, that should tell you something. Um, I see, whoa, looking at ICOs, $3.7 billion in ICOs in 2017 across 234 companies, and that's an average of 16 million per company. Just to give you a perspective, in just 2017, in 2016, none of you heard of an ICO, admit it. Uh, in 2017, it was 6% of total funding. 6% in one year. So what do we make of that? Uh, these are some of the biggest. These are the five that were above 150 million. So I'd like to talk about some of the warnings that I have about ICOs. They're pretty obvious. The first is overcapitalization. There is a danger when you give nascent businesses too much money before they've had the opportunity to figure out product market fit. We know that from 50 years of venture funding, and yet we're right back there again. There's a lack of governance. When you give people a bunch of money and you don't have good governance in these companies of what they can do with the money or what they can do with the coin or even what the foundation that ultimately stores the coins can do, you'll see problems, as we've seen going on lately in Switzerland. But even at a governance level, for all the criticism that I read of places like Uber and why didn't the board do this, that, and the other, I would point out the last 10 years of a push towards founder-friendly boards has also led the inability of capital to play an important role in oversight and governance. And I think we're seeing some of the negative sides of that now. And I think that, that we're going to see a lot more of that in the next five years, the negative side of lack of corporate governance. And ICO, as far as I can tell, most of these firms raising money have like zero corporate governance. So I don't, I'm not very optimistic of how that ends up. Also, too early liquidity. Everybody cites the great thing that with coins, I can pull money out really early, really quickly. The problem with venture is you can't get liquidity. Well, the problem with early liquidity is it kind of screws with incentives. With early liquidity, you have, a, you have a, a vested interest as a founder in jacking things up really quickly, pulling money off the table, and then who cares what happens from here? I just made all my money, now I'm playing on house money. And the same is true of venture capitalists, and the same is true of the celebrities that people put out there to pump up the price of their ICO. So we'll see whether people like Floyd May Mayweather uh, end up with the SEC visiting them. Um, but it creates a moral hazard when you have early liquidity in a business that hasn't proven itself. So you'll see rise of scams. You'll see an erosion of long-term trust with more people having lost money. That doesn't mean that this industry is bad. It doesn't mean it won't exist. It's just not gonna be the entire market. And we have a long way to go to work out how to do this in a safe and trustworthy way. And therefore, you will see the rise of uh, governmental regulations that we've seen The SEC is now getting much more active in this space. So what does all this mean? Really, global is here to stay. Uh, as hard as Donald Trump may work to er erode our global markets, I think the global markets are here to stay. Number two, uh, I predict that the warming is going to be in place for funding for the next two years with the asterisk of uh, what Nassim Taleb warned us about, which is black swans, unforeseen events. Because when unforeseen events happen in global capital markets, it changes everything like that in a day. And that could happen. And we talked to our portfolio about preparing for black swans. Um, I think returns are ultimately what matters in venture capital. And I believe that the overfunding and the new capital moving into this market that may not have the same price discipline or same objectives will likely depress returns overall in our industry. And I suspect the debate that we'll be having somewhere between 2018 and 2022 is what negative impact did all this overcapitalization for our industry have? And then finally, I would say that I predict a lot of ICO backlash. I don't know if it'll pick up in 2018 or take till 2019, but I think uh, global markets and hopefully journalists you know, doing research into actually what's happening in a lot of these companies will shine a light that I think longer term will build a more healthy 
and long-term successful cryptocurrency and ICO market. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.